unless absolutely necessary. So the easiest thing to do is, of course, to have a tolerance and perfect will error that you uh, allow. That's not always enough because some things like the tangent function have singularity and if one's just on the left and one's on the right then you're going to get these massive pixel errors. Um, so what I ended up doing was just having an allowable or overall RMS error of the entire image. That's really square. Cool. Really square. Yeah. 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 Um, and those together basically allow you to drop the tolerances down so it's accurate enough that the test means something but that I won't trigger accidentally. Well, not accidentally, it's, it, it always triggers if it if there's something wrong. Um, when you actually want it to. <laughs> yeah. oh. So I'll just, yeah, this is just a quick example. So you generate the reference image, or you can load it off disk. I generate them, um, run the test, and then just call the gen diff image with the right tolerance and RMS error. And then I always save the images to disk because if a test fails, you need the images, particularly the, the diff image, to, to know why, what's going on. And it somehow didn't like the programming that manually. I assume you have a video player on this? Emotion. No, no. Emotion? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Third mono variant. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what I use. I would recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> it works. Except it doesn't have HTTPS built in. Oh, there's always something. <laughs> there's a playlist you try there. All right, I probably don't have my icons set up or anything in this machine. It's my fault. Typical, I don't use GUIs very much. Typical developer. <laughs> so this, is just, this shows it just, this is the whole yeah, thing running all the tests screen. for a walk 3 Nova. I guess it doesn't look like much because every test is the absolute bare minimum that you need to check does this feature work. Oh. So it's just doing things like checking, you know, does the line width work, does the MIP mapping work, the auto MIP mapping generation, are they, you know, do, does the sign function work? Cosine, um, if else, and all that. So they're really, really simple tests. Are you, are you talking shaders or shade? Oh well, shaders, um, graphics features like the stencil buffer, depth buffer. It, it runs through everything. Uh -huh. And then every time someone comes back to me with a bug, that usually results in another test somewhere. Jeez. You actually follow the textbook. <laughs> Well, but, but they always say to do this, but we never do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with this, it's really, really, really necessary, or things would be breaking in the <coughs> other release. Well, that, that's the thing about the old Warp 3D that always bugged me was uh, I'd get a driver or whatever, and you run it, and you say, oh, this thing turned green. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, say it's not <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? I mean, End, end users just want their software to work, and developers want, if, if I call this function, then it does this, right? So, yeah, yeah. So I found with Warp 3D Nova, the first release I was relying on the examples I wrote, I'd written, and after that it was, okay, I have to, I have to have some kind of automated testing. Um, so yeah, this is, as you can see, it run, builds all the tests, runs through all the tests, and then so 14 test sets passed, obviously, because I'm not going to yeah. send a release to the beta testers unless everything's working. Oh. So I just run this every time. <laughs> no fun in that. Every time, <laughs> every time <laughs> we do a new release, that. Um, I'll run through this to make sure that there's nothing broken. Oh. And I tend to, yeah, as I'm implementing a new feature, I'll write a new set of tests for it. Um, so as I said, I have somewhere in this directory. Just got some references. Um, I've got an LHA file which I can give to anybody who wants to. Mm -hmm. Which has got the, the script 
and a simple example, and well, also the common. Would it, be, would it be okay if I put that on the wiki? It, we were going to. Where's Matthew? We were going to put it on the. Was it the Omega Dev wiki? Yeah. Put, yeah. Put, put it on the other wiki too. Okay. Put it on the other wiki. You can talk to Matthew about it. No. Oh. 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 Now oh. it's an encumbered <laughs> piece of Matty OS now. <laughs> it is. You yeah. have to go to the Matty OS wiki. Oh, that's, that's the thing, right? That, this. This presentation is based on the work I did for all three of you. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, I'll hang on, sir. Um, so I was hoping just to put all this <coughs> in. Pay <Yeah>. work. <laughs> you know, we can link to it anyway. There's this yeah. thing called the internet now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't tell Matthew. What about deep linking into content on other websites was illegal? Depends what state you're in. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do it across country lines. <laughs> Put your server in Senegal. Well, it depends how many aircraft carriers you have. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> big stick always wins. <laughs> Sorry, we're doing Ten big yeah, sticks work better. Fine. So, I mean, that's basically everything I wanted to run through. So, if anyone's got any specific questions, answer them. So, when that video was running and it goes through and does all the graphics, every one of them is is has your automated ability to tell whether or not the, the graphics rendered right and all that. Yeah, it's, and it, it's only coming out in what's printing in the text to say it passed or not. Is that? Um, it's so it's passed or I, I can yeah, yeah. Okay. Again. Yeah. So yeah, every I sort of I've got multiple test programs. Right. So each one runs mm. several tests. It does. Okay. Um, yeah. It doesn't. Have, you don't so ever have it do anything where it goes and tests something different or it waits for a response and the tests on that conditionally it just. Fixed tests. It's fixed tests. Mm -hmm. As I say, it's as simple as possible. Um, it doesn't hang up on fail. No, I mean it. It depends. If like I have on occasion had bugs in the compiler that caused the GPU to crash, right? And at that point, it can well, hang. And then and. The output that it gives you is just what's coming in here, or does it, when it fails, what does it tell you? So when it fails, let's go back to the presentation. So when it fails, I'll look and there's a results subdirectory for each test program, and you'll oh, end up with okay. these images in there for every test. So then I can go through and see, for example, this one, I deliberately screwed up one of the functions just to, to show the example. So in this one, you can see the white area, that's where it's failing. Right. Gray, that's where it's passing. Um, so then at this point, you can say, well, why, why is it failing? But they this look almost the same section. Yeah, they it's do. Naked eye, right? Yeah. Yeah. I multiplied the input number by. 1.1 or 1.2 wow. to shift the function over slightly. Yeah. Just, just enough to, so this isn't completely great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I have had situations where they look almost the same. You've had subtle errors? Subtle errors like this. But for example, that reciprocal function. 1 over x. Yeah. 1 over x. Yeah. And, and I did find that when I did one more iteration of Newton's method yeah. manually, that the results were then within um, oh my goodness. Within one out of wow. the limits of it, bit back. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's been that hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, there's subtle things like that you find out later. Jeez. As you're doing this stuff. Wow. Yeah. And how did you handle the singularities again? Like, you, you just said RMS, but. At, at some point, I decided that. What do you do with those? So it, it will take root mean square error yeah. over the entire image and just say, look, um, if it, it'll set the tolerance low enough that if, if, I'm, if I know it's doing what it's supposed to, um, then it'll pass. So you can set the tolerance just high enough. But then basically I would allow like a thin strip of pixels on the diff image to be above the tolerance. Yeah. <coughs> Like, because obviously otherwise you need to put the tolerance the, from 0 to 256. Yeah. And then everything passes. Yeah, I, I, I think I ran into this once and uh, 
way we solved it is we put a duplicate beside the singularities. Put two. There's the singularities here. Ah, okay. And then you put another one over here, and then you go over the whole. You go over the singularity. Kind of right. See if you're within. How close can you get before it goes? <laughs> yeah. That's was one way. I mean, one of the problem. other. One of the other tricks that I did was so you know if the singularity occurs at zero, then I'll just shift my test function so that each pixel is at minus 0.5. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't actually hit a singularity itself. Yep, we'll see. Yeah. Interesting. Because yeah. you've got other things like um, with rounding, I think the GLSL specification says that you can choose which rounding algorithm you use. At, yeah, at oh, 0. no. Oh, no. So rounding mode basically. So, yeah, yeah. So you can round up, you can round towards zero, you can round to the common the uh, closest even number. Oh you don't do all that just uh, no, no, that's no, it's <laughs> you know, particularly when they say you can choose. So can I choose that per meter or is that per no, it's, it's, the it's like the implement, the implementer, like the hardware implementer. Oh, the hardware implementer can choose. Yeah. Oh, so your your sapphire and your whatever can have yeah, different yeah, routing modes. They can choose <coughs> different routing methods. No, if they want to. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, we're gonna use sapphire. They, they do both. They do they really? Yeah, they can. They so do both A and B and B. Okay. So they're like GSMC with A and B's recipe or something. Yeah. That's actually even cheaper. That's more expensive. Brand new. It's official. Yeah. Wow. Huh. It's pretty cool. I had no idea graphics cards were this bad. <laughs> like, and then your GPU just crashes when it doesn't like something. <laughs> yeah, that, they're getting better with that. They're getting better with that. <laughs> so when you say crash, did you actually have like a hang set signal or something like that? The, yeah, the GPU will hang. So you, usually what happens is you've got a string of commands that you're sending this GPU. And then the GPU writes to a particular address, writes a number to a particular address, so you know what it's executed so far, what it's completed. Um, and if it hangs, that number will never advance. Oh wow! So you don't even know why you don't even know why it hung. There are no like hardware checks. Oh, there's um, they have some debugging registers, but, but like I specifically so contacted them. They said, yeah. the the real debugging registers. But like, it's not really documented, and that's very complicated. So I've just got the general ones that tell you, you know, this module, all the graphics cards, not functioning anymore, that kind of thing. Or, or the shader is still active, for example, because I have, uh, I have had a bug report that turned out to be an infinite loop, the shader. I have you, you can do, and then the graphics card just sits there. Yeah, it's hot. Yeah, it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> Generating heat uh, and, and bits of paper can place. Um, I, I think on some systems they will have a timeout, and then after that they'll reset the GPU and reinitialize it. I don't really like that because sometimes you might have. Okay, we don't have compute shaders yet, but if you've got a compute shader, you might have something that needs to run a few minutes. So if you don't want a timeout, kind of yourself, we're trying to get a way to engage, disengage the timeouts, like you can engage, oh, disengage a break or control C. I think that solves it now by having multiple, multiple different uh, submission channels. So you've got one for graphics, and you know, obviously, if it's taking several seconds with graphics, Taking a minute with graphics, you know it's actually time. Uh, and a different one for compute. 
so that you can run longer term so tasks. So are the handful providers on the chip actually programmable by the, by the user are you or are they sorry are they what? Are the hand pulse, so the way this usually works right is a hand pulse that uh, my, my question is is can you change the interval of the, of the hand pulse? Um, before the GPU says okay. Well you're saying it doesn't even say it, it just doesn't it doesn't there's not really a hang signal, it's the driver that needs to uh, say well that's really primitive, man. Yeah. yeah. But it's like there because there is a, a small what is this? Small FIFA buffer and ring buffer in there that you say, okay, I've got some more commands over here. And when that's full, obviously you just sit there waiting for it to free up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and after, if after 30 seconds, there's still no room in that little buffer, then you pretty much know that something went wrong. That's terrible. Do you have any use, you have any use like the depth of the command buffer to determine whether or not that it is still alive? Well, oh, it's starting over. The GPUs. I mean, old, I, it needs I can't OS. think of any way. Uh, I guess it's starting over. Actually. If someone has a shader that has an infinite loop in it, I can't think of any way of detecting that, uh, except for a timeout or some sort of hardware-based forward progress monitor. I suppose so. Yeah. But we have that sort of thing on modern smart processors. Sure. But the, the amazing thing about GPUs is that you think of them as like. Complex beasts. They're really tiny, tiny, tiny bits of like, execution logic, and you just instance them thousands of times, right? This is it's it's amazing. It, it, it's it's massive. It's, it's massive parallelism. Yeah. yeah, that's how you get speed. Right? Yeah, but the actual execution units themselves are pretty darn simple. Yeah, and the, the latest programming model is they call it single instruction, multiple thread. Okay, so you. You've got several threads running, executing the same instruction in the same instance, um, which with the compiler got really annoying when doing if else logic, because that means that okay, let's usually you're banking on all the threads, particularly if you're drawing graphics. You know, all these pixels are probably going to take the same path, but if half of them take one path and half of them take another path, then you need to execute both paths and disable these threads during the if, and disable those during the else, <laughs> and then enabling them all at the end of the if else block. Because you need the results of your <coughs> because Well, because that's the way it works. It, these, these threads, this block of threads executes the same instruction yeah. at the same time. You know, it helps simplify the logic and all that. Um, so if you've got threads within that block going through different paths, then you need to execute both paths and make sure that only the thread that's supposed to go through the if block goes through the if block. And only the threads that go through the else go through the else. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Arbitration, I guess. And you had to do this? The shader compiler has to do that, yeah. Oh, God! Yeah, he's good. Well, yeah, don't worry, it's just taken care of, and that's what some of these, I'm not quite a number of these unit tests are dealing with. Make sure, can I do nested and if else? Yeah, I, I, saw, do I saw that loops. comment and I went, well, why is that so hard? <laughs> you know, this from, is from an outsider point of view? Yeah, maybe it just is a new feature. <laughs> this is why. <laughs> this is why. Yeah. Wow. Because it's particularly if you've got an if else with a loop inside one of the if blocks. Wow. Um, yes. Yeah. And you, and you want it all to work, execute the right code path yeah. for each of the different threads. This yeah. reminds me of that, uh, that language, that multi threading language. I was in MPL, maybe? MPL? Yeah. What's it called? Where you have to put little tags in your code saying, I'm now going into a loop. All threads sync here, and then you put guards on the things and synchronization points. And you have to litter your C code with stuff. Yeah. And then you compile it, and then it works on this massively parallel whatever target you're playing with. Yeah. Right? It's similar 
kind of problems. Or you can't just write any code you feel like. Yeah. You have to do it a certain way. But, I mean, I haven't looked at it too much, but if you look at OpenCL, I think it looks like OpenCL kind of assumes a single structure multiple threads architecture. And you've got blocks of common threads. Yeah. So how does OpenCL deal with the different graphics chips? I mean, is it this? It's pre-processing the stuff that sends to the graphics cards, and it's either NVIDIA or Radeon or this or that I, series or whatever. It's all up to the, the driver or whoever writes the, the driver. Compiler. The compiler's supposed to be it. Yeah. Because OpenCL can also run on your main processor. You can use it for general multi-threading. Well, not general multi-threading, you can use it for parallel processing on the CPU. Mm -hmm. But you can't just write anything you feel like. All the rules. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the... the all, all threads run the same code. Yeah, yeah. Tie one hand behind you. <laughs> Interesting. Huh. Okay, if there are no other questions, we can... No, I just I, I think it's pretty. I think it's pretty cool. Um, pretty great high speed uh, compute uh, error thresholds. Uh, that's pretty cool. I, I was thought that to be a problem. Who knew? Oh. <laughs> you find out later. <laughs> you find out the hard way. You find out. Oh boy. We just need to extend this level of automated testing to. Uh, Every library. Every, say everything, yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm having, uh, I've created a minimal example with the mm -hmm. driver because I've, I've looked in the past for various unit testing frameworks and yeah, in the end I thought, this is the simplest way, it's a very simple script, very simple make, make files um, and I can get on with it. Yeah. That's what you use. I mean, I've used CPP unit in the past. All those fancy things, but that's a different level. But uh, they try to make it. And, and added thing. to that, with because I'm doing graphic stuff, mm. those frameworks don't deal with graphics anyway. So they don't still do two dimensions. To, <laughs> yeah. So I'd, I'd still have to write something. Yeah. Uh, to do the visual I think. Yeah. You have to be diff or whatever it's called. Cool. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Very nice. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. I think I think that's a good spot to break. <coughs> thank you, Hans. You came all the way from New Zealand to present this. So. Very nice indeed. Yeah. Just this. Well, Sacramento is yeah. a destination yeah. city now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Vacation hotspot. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Did you guys go to the Kings game last night? First season opener. That's sports or something. Okay, I think we'll, we'll break it there.
Anyway, it goes round and round, right? And it was all, what, what, what year was that? Oh, 86? 86. So I found a yeah. website which documented this juggler demo. Somebody actually did all the digging for me. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's got the cover art, 1987. There's a whole big blurb about it and how Commodore didn't believe it was real and, and, uh, Thought it was a fraud. <laughs> yeah, the guy interviewed yeah. um, Eric Graham. Yeah, it's by Eric Graham. Um, some call him Dr. Eric Graham. I guess he's got a PhD or something. That maybe he's an MD. Anyway, <laughs> he's the um, creator of Sculpt 3D. Remember from way back? Well, this is one of the earliest demos he did to play around with ray tricks. That was his thing. And uh, he wrote a little letter in uh, 2000 to this Ernie Wright fellow, this is his website, explaining what happened. Thank you. <laughs> Mega 1000, blah, blah, blah. Uh, written a simple ray tracing while he was in Manchester. Uh, Free Flexo writer. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flexo writer. Ooh, 20 minutes in the apartment is built, 1,000 bucks. <laughs> he was playing around with graphics with a, a type printer, right? It's just, these guys, they're just brilliant, right? Yeah. They're just brilliant, these guys. They come up with this stuff, you know? He can, considers it normal. <laughs> 20 years later, yeah, full in 1986, you go adding a room. Blah, blah, blah. It's like he's got this big long story. It's awesome. Uh, you're welcome to read it uh, now or later, whatever. Uh, the website up there, the URL, probably want to grab that. It's a pretty interesting story. <laughs> yeah, the legal department thought it was a hoax. That's the interesting bit. <laughs> They sent them a thousand bucks or maybe two thousand bucks, and that was it. That's all he ever got. <laughs> so they used it to, to promote Amiga, right? Who bought them off? Commodore? Yeah. yeah with, Commodore. It, with, with a thousand, two thousand dollars? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's it. Wow. It's iconic, right? <laughs> it's true. And then he said, a year or so later, Tom Petty included a second of the juggler in a music video. See, that's, that's probably the part Hans de Ruder didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Squeeze a hundred bucks and a copy of the tape out of his record company. <laughs> Not much for royalties. <laughs> well, he, but anything under three seconds it, it considered, can be considered uh, uh, teaching or, or, or uh, demo stuff. Uh, I don't know, back then even? Maybe. Mm -hmm. okay. And then he started on a Sculpt 3D December 26, 1986. And uh, yeah, the rest we know. But that was an interesting little bit about uh, him getting a little bit of money from it, from the demo. Well, and then there's video and I downloaded it. See, what, what I did was uh, I found a copy of this, thanks to Olaf Bartle, uh, who was archiving it, of the original source code used for the tracer that made that demo. Right? And now you all have a copy of it. You have that now. This is the, um, the one I gave you is actually a little bit cleaned up. Uh, quite a bit cleaned up. The original, original code, which is just called RT, I think. Uh, let me get historic. Where did we put it? Trunk. Where is it here? RT. There it is. The original, there it is. Oh, it's glory. Um, this is Eric Wright's original. This is Eric's original. Oh, I should uh, probably make the font slightly larger. Maybe. Where's the font? File. I went through this last year. Yep. I remember. Where in the heck was it? Project? View. View? Status? No. File. Oh, that would make sense. Tab signs. Global, global. Yeah. Select font. Oh, you see it. Oh, there it is. 
Oh, I can get Topaz 80, that's better. <laughs> so what, what I did was I, thanks to Paul, Paul found uh, Eric's email through the Internet Archive. I emailed Eric Graham and said, uh, what do you think about releasing your source code to the public? So we, we went back and forth a little bit, and he wanted to make it public domain, but it turns out once you release something under copyright, it's really hard to turn it off. You can't just say, oh, it's public domain now. That doesn't work. <laughs> you have to go through a whole procedure to remove your copyright from it. And he went, well, yeah, yeah, I went, I don't know some, the lawyers got involved. So I'm looking this up too. Eric said, this looks a lot harder than I thought. And I said, you're right. This is really hard. So we went, well, okay, that won't work. Let's keep it under copyright and release it under GPL then. Right? And thus, I added the banner, which is this new banner that says GPL on it, yada, 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 copyright, Eric Graham, 87, 2017. See? <laughs> And it's part of Ray Tracer or RT. Right? So after I got his approval, I went, okay, I'm going to release this to the wild, which I haven't yet. I, mean, I was going to upload it to, to Aminet, and now I have to write a readme for it and stuff like that, right, Just to do that. But we're going to release, release the GPL version of the original Ray Tracer, and uh, people can do whatever they want with it, right? No. <laughs> Anything they want. You delete it. <laughs> Give it to your cat. I don't care, right? <laughs> but it's under GPL now, so you got to share whatever you're doing with it. That was the important thing, because we wanted public domain, but that didn't work. So we GPL. I can't believe it's not hard to make it public domain. You wouldn't think, would you? You look it up. <laughs> it's particularly it's your content. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what if you don't do anything and just let it go into the wild? Well, someone could claim that they own it, right? The idea is that. You don't want someone else claiming it ah, okay. as their own. So it's not that it's you trying to do something. It's someone else, My some, usually a corporation, not to pick on them, but <laughs> try to grab it and then they try to make it their own. Oh, come on. Corporations are people too. You know? They want stuff. Yeah, yeah. There are people in the US that forgot. <laughs> That's just so twisted. Um, <laughs> but to protect it, Try to protect it. Put it under GPL. Now, if some some big multinational decides to make a new <laughs> juggler yeah. with this and, ray tracer, and, and actually, the, the juggler terminology has been used in several movies and other things. Anyway, uh, there was a movie with Danny Kaye that was all about a juggler. Well, I mean, there you go. Right there. I don't know. But this this program. If they do that, then the Free Software Foundation has a way to get them so. <laughs> to release their source code. No, it's not about us versus them, it's about keeping the source code free, right? That's the whole idea, keep it free for everyone. <laughs> so, there it is. And what happened was, uh, Olaf Bartle took this original source code and he created what he called a port. He called it port, where he made a nice make file for it. The original was not a make file. He fixed up all the warnings and errors and this and that. And most importantly, added a nice little GUI to it. So it's got a little window, and you can as a menu. And they started adding options like uh, save to PNG, and he's going to add an option to, to save an animation directly from uh, the ray tracer. So it's kind of becoming something bigger than it ever was, right? And so I went back to his version, and I added the GPL to his too, because now his is automatically GPL too. Cause his, he never released his. It was a private project, and he wants to release it too, right? which he's going to do after the show. So <laughs> I added GPL to his as well. So now anything that was based on Eric's stuff now has two copyrights. I really wish I could uh, keep that font the same. Maybe I just keep loading it. That, that might work. Go to global. There you go. Global again. Try it again. This one. This one. This one. That's good. There you go. See, the copyrights might be different now. Because in 20, 2015 is when uh, Olaf did his changes. 
There's no way to save the settings. Mm -hmm. Probably. In the text yeah. editor. I don't want to yet. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, copyright Olaf as well for anything he changed. Now Olaf didn't want his changes, all of his changes, under GPL. So his unique files are public domain. The rest is GPL. <laughs> so he didn't have a problem changing it back because he never released it originally. Yeah. Right. yeah. Because no one else has got a copy. That kind of thing. It's it matters when you release it. That's what it matters. Whatever that defined is defined to mean. Um, I'll just load the scene file. Like he made up a unique scene file file, which reads and write, reads and uh, error detection, reads a scene file, written by Olaf Public Domain. See, so in the in the wacky world of software licenses, you're allowed to have multiple licenses on the same file if, or the same project if you want to. So that's what we're doing. Fine. Well, I took Bolus version, which runs on Amigo OS 2.x and 4.0, or 4.x, right? And I went, well, I don't want that 2.x garbage. <laughs> and I made another one. <laughs> this one's in your copyright. Yes. You get the hang of it. Yeah. <laughs> now, my version is the one I gave you, right? You have that up now on your hard drive. Because you're making a public domain and you haven't released it yet. Now it's released. <laughs> it's now out there, right? Um, and I renamed it Amy Ray Tracer because I like to put Amy in front of everything. And I went and changed some stuff too. So what did I do? There I am, see? Copyright me. I didn't have to, but I want your name in stars. I want I want my name attached yeah, to, to this uh, this wild star that's going. <laughs> so now you have a copy too, right? Now, if you want to make a release of this, please feel free to do so. You may or may not want to add your copyright. If you don't, it's your choice. Well, I was thinking we could, I could put the AmiWiz on the globes. Is, it, is the Ami, you'd be doing the AmiWiz Oh, yeah, you can do you whatever you want with it. It's yours now, right? <laughs> and there's nothing anyone can do to stop you. Well, you could have stopped me anyway, but you, well, I could, you, you could take the power from. button on you and <laughs> <laughs> slow you down a little. Give me a few minutes. Steve, do we need an updated C line uh, includes for this? No. Okay. No. It should just work. It should just make? Yeah, make. It should just make without uh, anything else. If I did it right. <laughs> it, but, yeah, it's complaining about a missing function in the. Uh, Live. In standard live. Yeah, get program name. You're running the new SDK, aren't you? <coughs> no. 330? You mean two years ago? Yeah. 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 2015. You are? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. That's what's and that's what hmm. that's what, says. Says. That's what SDK version dot well, text and the You know, maybe it's in the uh, somewhere. I think so. And I can do you know to uh twenty Oh, then I must have uh, I must have made the classic error of um, using the new DOS includes maybe, and it hasn't been released to the public yet. It's the same possible. Colin changes the name. Because it, it's the same function, release. it just has a different name. Right. Maybe it just includes. Um, Is there a DOS obsolete in your? Uh, in the includes. Like, yeah. Well, well yeah, the DOS has been updated. There's a file called DOS obsolete. Yeah. Oh, it was called get CLI program name. I see. All right, I apologize. No, <laughs> it really should have got that SDK up. But if you include DOS obsolete in the top, it'll work. Basically, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> obsolete dot each. As I took that line out because I thought I don't need it. But you need copyright. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Not for that. Because <laughs> if you're trying to compile it, which you should be doing, yeah. 
Do you know what I mean by dos slash obsolete dot I can show you. If you go up here, you go close. Done. You can't use wildcard with the graph included in the SDK? For uh, uh, I don't know. It depends what shell you're in. So. <laughs> yeah. You add that line, cross slash obsolete dot h. That should fix it. But. Sorry, uh, or you can just change that function, of course, to whatever it's supposed to be. What file is that in? Uh, RT1? Wait a minute, are you link time or compile time? It's it's compile time. Oh. The error, no, the error, the error, the error, I get the error when the linker's called. Linker? Yeah. You don't have to do clib2 then. Yeah. That's what the problem is. Oh, do I need to go to um, uh, OS4 Depot? Yeah. You have the wrong clib2? Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Did it it uses clib2. I thought you were talking compile time. Nope. You're talking link time. Oh, that's a totally different animal. Okay, so it compiles fine. That's good. Uh, at least I know that. Uh, the link, because uh, that was released oh four months ago or something. The CLIB two. Yeah, in but it's in not the in the current SDK. <laughs> it's in the new SDK. Come on. Yes, yes. You know, we might be able to use newlib instead. Let's try that briefly. Since you're here anyway. Why don't I have a shell that's on my project? There it is. Okay. Where is that? Uh, GNU make file. Zlib2. Go here, go like that. Uh. <laughs> See? Probably runs. Should. Because there's hardly any Zlib that uses at all. That's probably the quickest solution to get it running immediately. Well, I need to update the SFC lab anyway. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> Let's just, I left it as CLIP2 because that's a goal it likes to use. So I didn't want to make too much change too fast. But we should switch it to new lib anyway. This is a goal of new lib versus CLIP2. Let's see. Scene file and then there's support. Support. And voila. Yep, it does work. It does work. Yep. Just take out CLIB2 from the GNU main file. It's not running, it's just it's just showing the That's right. It's a ray tracer. It does one frame at a time. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> How long does it take to do the 30 frames. Well, one frame took that long. <laughs> On my, I got a, a 460. Mm -hmm. You have an X1000, it's probably going to be a blink. <laughs> so the trick is, go to your GNU make file and take out the option where it says dash M CRT equals CLIB2. Take that out. That should be it. Take it in there because Olaf was planning on doing something? No, I just didn't want to change it yet. Alright. Now it's changed. Maybe I'll do the public version with the new lib just to avoid this problem. Then we got no more problems. Because I didn't put it on the wiki yet, so that's, that's a good thing probably. Dude. Did it work? It works. Okay, it's going to be weird. No, with the new C line too, it's, uh, it works. Well, oh, yeah, I work with that too. Yeah. Oh, this is really great. So you can actually move the camera position around with yes. the keyboard. Yes. Oh. That's all Olaf's work. Oh, I thought the or didn't the original one have that? Nothing. And then, well, it had a, a window and maybe some key control that could do something. That was it. You could look at the original code, it's going to go up too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Olaf added all the fancy stuff. <coughs> it's really nice, actually, what he did. So it's, it's becoming kind of a poor man's ray tracer program. 
Sculpt. Yeah, Sculpt. <laughs> Yeah, no. Sculpt was a nice program I bought. Now the only thing that I will say though is once um, this is this is just like a raw intuition window. Yep. And you, you have to quit this thing in order to get control. Oh yeah. The movie. It like does it, some it, weird stuff. It does some weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, that was the one. The next. The one thing I was going to mention. Uh, let's see. What was my list? Web page. Ray tracer files. Explain copyright. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, 4.1 standards. So that was my next blurb. So I updated the API to 4.1 standards, right? And look at that, now it's dead. You're thinking, oh, it's dead. No, it isn't. It's still there. It's just really weird. Look at that. Artifacts everywhere. You can do this. Isn't that neat? No. Oh, wait. Is it possible? Because there were all these things about smart refresh and things like that in GUI press. Yeah. But the old intuition window isn't getting cleaned up. He it's already time, knows. It's time to introduce. Well, where is the puzzle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it came you from me, so you need that. to puzzle it out. You aren't supposed to know that. What's oh. incredible is the backwards, compatibility <laughs> of, the backwards compatibility of intuition at this point still allows you to do this sort of... Uh, yeah, this, this hard hammering of it's pixels. No, but the fact that it works on an architecture that's so completely yeah. different to the original hardware. Yep. Yeah. Who did the intuition port over OS for? That was Olaf. Well, he should be very pleased with himself. Yeah. That's impressive. He did a pretty good job. Yeah. Right. I think it's time to introduce our friend here to uh, the window class. Yep. Oh, yeah. Big time. Yeah. You know, the biggest problem with this right now is it renders directly into that RAS port. Doesn't play nice with the GUI preps that we have, the compositing. Yeah. So if you go into compositing, turn compositing off, it works just like it used to in the original. Oh, it, won't, it won't goof up anything. Cool. Yeah. Oh. It so just, it just does That's that with the special effects on. Oh, I see. Yep. And it gets all strange and the window kind of disappears. And you're like, <laughs> what's going on? It's because it's, kind of, it's, it's hammering that bit map, right? And compositing does a trick where it, it renders to a different bitmap to do its moving. Well, so it, right? yeah. It's writing to the screen bitmap. Right? Yes. The screen RAS port, not the Windows RAS port. No, it's writing to the Windows RAS, RAS port, which is a strange thing. But, but this ray tracer, after all I've got through with it, has multi-processing in it. So he added a separate child process that does the rendering into the original process. So he's got you got your main program running, right? Your window. The rendering into that window is done by a third party process that just has a pointer to that RAS port. It's just hammering in there. That's how it's working. And he's running actually two processes in parallel to, to do the ray tracing. <laughs> you can have up to N. So you can uh, run 10 processes if you want. And he said in an email to me, the original idea was to show off uh, multi-core. But multi-core is waiting on it. going, so... <laughs> but it's ready, it's ready. Right? It'll, it'll actually do ray tracing in multiple processes. And that's a really neat part about this program. Uh, but the bug is that it uh, renders direct into the Windows RAS port and messes things up. And I, I haven't figured out exactly why it's and why it's doing this why it's causing a problem right because I thought you could render it to a window RAS port and it shouldn't be a problem but there's an interaction with compositing and the extra process so my theory <laughs> is that if I didn't spawn that child process and just ran it on the original process it'll be in sync but I haven't tried it yet I didn't have time <laughs> I was going to say, this is an exercise for the reader, for the student. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, you're not going to get a free ride. <laughs> so it's got a bit of a quirk, right? It's got that quirk. Uh, create new proc. There it is. It's got these rendering processes that run, and they're called Amy Ray Tracer Renderer. And if you open up Ranger, you can see them there doing their little work. You can see your main process and whatever shell you launched it from, or workbench, and you can see the little renderer is going. Oh, um, there it is. Found it? Yes. Good. Good. There, it is. there they are. Yeah. yeah. 
See this Michelle process? There's two renderers. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that neat? That is very cool. Yeah, this is beyond just ray tracing. It, it's like a multi-processing cool little thing. <laughs> Love Olo's work. He's pretty, pretty cool. I, I think the way maybe to get it to run would be to make a private bitmap or and, a, and put a RAS port on it and render it to that by these processes and then clip blit that to the front one. Use the main process to pull it from the uh, from the background bitmap. Then it'll be in sync. That's my theory. I, I haven't had time to try it, but I think it'll work. It uses up uh, extra memory, but it would mean I could have like eight renderers running, throwing it into this private bitmap, and then, well, maybe I wouldn't use a private bitmap. I'd probably put it on the video card. Hey, that's another thing. Because <laughs> I know how that works underneath now. You probably want to allocate the bitmap on the card so it can use the, whatever blitters or whatever it has in the background, or you can use the compositing engine, I guess, to. Is that true, Hans? Could I use the compositing engine to pull from a, from a bitmap on the video card and then put it into the window RAS port? Is that, is that an operation that would be fast? I'd have to let the, that composite YUV demo, the source code for that has the method of how you can composite straight into a window. Yeah, yeah. You right. need to use a, uh, a hook. Yeah, there was a trick to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah because you can't, you can't render with composite tags, it doesn't go to a RASP, but it goes to the bitmap itself. Oh, it's just to bitmaps? Yes. Yes, that's right. That's so that's why you need to use a hook right. to um, yeah. do all the clipping. Yes. Yeah, that, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, I release that to the public sometimes. Yes, it's, it should be on the wiki. Yeah, it's on there somewhere. On the wiki somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did that some years back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I remember going through that with you. <laughs> Look at that. See, it doesn't clean up after it quits sometimes. See, it leaves the garbage. And then you just, you just, you all done. It's a big eraser. I thought, it, I thought, oh no, it's corrupting memory or something. Like, oh, wait a minute, it's using these processes to cheat. And, which works great if you don't have compositing effects on it because everything's in sync. But the compositing effects, it has these background processes that throw well, it off. With the, compo with the compositor, it's um, when something changes, then it redraws that part of the screen. Yeah, that part. Right, but that means it has to know when you're done drawing to it. So if you're drawing to it in the third party process, then yeah, I can see it. That's what I think we're doing. Yeah. We're outside of the scope that it knows and writing to it. Yeah. It can sync it. Like if you're writing to a bitmap, when you unlock the bitmap, that's probably when it says, okay, you're done, now I can <laughs> update it or something like oh, that. Oh, you know, I never tried just locking the bitmap. It's not very nice, but... <laughs> that's another way. That's a, another way to get, uh, get them in sync. But if you look in the rt3.c file, that's where all the magic is happening. Uh, if you're curious where all the Amiga stuff is happening, rt1.c and rt2.c are the pure ray tracing guts. Those are the, the stuff Eric wrote that does all the spheres.